Uh, my name is Bill Clater, and I'm a general dentist in Shelby, North Carolina. I've been in practice about 35 years, and um, I've uh, been using Celtra since about 2000, and I guess it was 2015 when it first came out as Celtra Duo. I believe it was introduced at the Chicago Midwinter Meeting, and I uh, instantly loved the, the aesthetics of the material, and I, I really enjoyed uh, being able to mill this in my office. Um, and I like the options of having the polishability aspect where I could just mill the crown and polish it and cement it, or I could have the option of uh, uh, milling the crown, polishing it, and then firing it, which helped the megapaxels, you know, it increased the strength, the flexural strength of it. So that's obviously why they call it duo. You can either polish it or fire it. So that's a, a real advantage for in-office use. Uh, I typically use Celtra Duo uh, in um, posteriors and anterior areas, mainly in molars and premolars, I, occasionally in aesthetic cases in the front. But when I have a real high aesthetic in case, I like to use Celtra Press. And the difference in Celtra Press and Celtra Duo is that Celtra Duo, as I've already mentioned, is a millable material that you can mill either in the office or in the lab. Your lab can do the, uh, the milling also. But Celtra Press is purely a pressable material that is used uh, that the laboratory has to do. So I send my cases either through a conventional impression. In my, in my case, I use Serona Connect where I send my cases and my lab will uh, uh, make the uh, Celtra Press there. The advantage of Celtra Press, uh, I, I really think it's, I, I call it the material that has the best of both worlds. And what I mean by that is the, we're always looking for high strength and yet aesthetic material. Uh, we have some materials in the past that have had the aesthetics but not the strength. And now we have some materials, uh, and, and in particular, I'm thinking of Vita and some of the Empress uh, material. But in, in the, as far as material that's extremely strong, obviously we have the zirconia and we have the different ranges of, of megapaxel strength in those. But one of the issues that has been a problem in the past is the, um, uh, the aesthetics. And I know that's improving as we speak, but Celtra is sort of in between. We can get anywhere from five to 700 megapaxels of strength and the aesthetics uh, of Celtra Press in my hands and what I've seen and used is impeccable. I mean, I've, I've never seen a material that uh, it has the chameleon effect that just uh, uh, takes on the color of the tooth. The, the blendability, if you will, of the material is extremely um, uh, important. And it, it's not only important, but it's, it's extremely forgiving. I think of it as a very forgiving material. It's also it's also a material that's um, it's also a material that is very opalescent and very translucent, which gives you that more lifelike look to it. Uh, and so, I, I, I typically on my high end aesthetic cases like to go with Celta Press. I have used it in the posterior regions also. It does extremely well. So I and, and several other points of Celta Press I want to make is that for those dentists who are not totally wanting to, to bond everything in, which I'm, I'm more of a bonded honest. I like to bond stuff, but you do have the option with self to press to cement it in with your uh, glass onomers or your um, cements like that. You can cement it or bond it. And so that gives you another advantage there for some people who, where that's an issue. So, so that's sort of where I'm coming from. Uh, as far as my practice, I have been using self to press since early this year. Um, Obviously, it's just hit the market in 2017. And um, the beauty that I like about working with my laboratory is that we have a, a system that, that I like to use. And if I, if I may, I'll show you a slide, um, if that's OK. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through this. Uh, there's your Celter uh, Duo uh, that I was talking about that was introduced in February of 16. And then the uh, Celter Press came out in March of 2017. And I really do feel like this is sort of the, this is the aesthetic future of dentistry. Um, one of the advantages of Celtra Duo, going back to that, is that you have 
clinically the advantage of seeing the, sh the shade of the tooth up front. You don't have to have a, a, a another another material that's in like a blue phase or a purple phase where you can't really tell the shade that you're really looking at. You're kind of having to guess where you stain and glaze. Well, with Seltzer Duo, you you know right up front exactly what you're what you're getting. Uh, I call Seltzer Duo the perfect crown because and and Seltzer Press because the chameleon effect and also the, the translucency just really is so lifelike. Um, some advantages of Seltra Press. It, it is a new generation of glass ceramics, as you can see. Um, it's not Emacs 2 or Empress 2 or anything like that. This is, this is something fresh and new. It's a whole different structure. It is a zirconia reinforced lithium silicate. The strength is um, there, as far as we've already mentioned, between over 500 high aesthetics, the chameleon effect that we've mentioned. And then also it's uh, with Seltzer, you have the option of duo and press, as, as I've already mentioned, and you can bond or cement it. Uh, for those who are not uh, digital, uh, the beauty is like this is, or the beauty of the material is that you can, as I've already mentioned, um, um, send it to your lab either conventionally uh, with polyvinyl impression or you can send it digitally and like I mentioned earlier for me it's Serona Connect um, and I will talk more about my uh, lab interaction here in just a moment. Okay so the material itself I want to just talk a little bit about what I'm thinking as a general dentist when I'm preparing a tooth I know this uh, it, and how it plays into choosing Seltra, say, over another material. Uh, obviously, one of the big issues, whether it's conventional impressions or digital impressions, is that in general, I think you can say, or most labs would would, would tend to agree with the statement that we tend to under-reduce our clusals, uh, our, our preps. And so I want to make sure that I have sufficient tooth reduction. And I'm not just reducing a tooth to make it thick, I'm reducing it to meet the requirements of the material. And I know that from talking with the labs and being in labs and, and hearing lab techs talk, one of the big issues uh, is that they constantly say that it's a, a, a major issue with the reduction, of the occlusal reduction. In fact, I believe that 3M did a study a number of years ago that said that when they interviewed lab techs, about 60% of the lab techs said one of their biggest issues was under-reduced occlusal. So, I want to make uh, sure that I do enough reduction. And the reason for that is pretty obvious. Reduction occlusively has to do with the strength and how well you know, you're going to get that megapaxel strength. So if you're under reducing and you're making it extremely thin, you're not going to get that resistance that you would get if you had enough reduction. When you look at rounded internal line angles, I think that not only has to do with seating, but it also has to do with fracture. So if you have sharp pointed preps, a lot of times, uh, we've, we, I think we forget as dentists that our cracks don't start externally and go internally. They start internally and go externally. So they start at the point where there's a sharp point on the prep, and then they, they radiate out. So I want to make sure that I've got rounded internal angles. I want smooth tapered walls so I'll get nice ad adaptation. Uh, Seltzer press and other materials, too, give you that. But the, 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 uh, the, the, the issue here is that we want... A, an extremely thin uh, space for our bonding uh, resin to go. We don't want thick spaces to try to rely on holding the crown in place or bonding the crown in place. So we want nice smooth walls. We also want, um, if, if you're prepping, like for instance, if I'm doing an anterior case and I don't have the, the luxury of, of doing heavy reduction, then I would probably go with Celtra Press because I can still get a very aesthetic uh, looking crowns with light chamfers, but uh, if I can get heavy or heavier chamfers, I will get them. And a lot of times that will determine whether I cement a crown or bond a crown. So if I have light chamfers, I will think more of a more retentive prep and talk about maybe cementing it in, or I guess you could bond it too. But if I have enough heavy, if I can get a heavy reduction uh, of, the, of the prep, uh, I will talk about bonding it in. And so uh, retentive preps are important if you're not bonding. That's, that's the point there. 
Uh, the other part here is that uh, the non-retentive preps that we do when we do uh, ceramic restorations is that we, if we're truly bonding it, we want to count on the number one, the enamel, and also the dentin, but mainly the enamel for retention, and we want rolled preps. And I always like to use the analogy in the days when we did gold and PFMs, we always kind of wanted like preps that were kind of M shape or W shape. So sort of like I call them the Rocky Mountains, you know, kind of not pointed, but kind of uh, tapered, sort of like the letter M. But in our new modern uh, ceramic, all ceramic uh, bonded restorations, we don't want that because that's a point of stress and a point of fracture. So we want more of, as I call it, the rolling hills of Scotland. We want more of the contoured kind of carpet-like roll to our, our preps. So it's not so much about having a retentive preps. It's about where you can place the margin. And if you have the enamel available, you want to try to use it. Uh, and of course, you know, we talk about retention already, but with the etched enamel and somewhat with the dentin. The polishability obviously have to do with aesthetics. The thing uh, with Celtra that I really like is this microstructure is extremely uh, small crystal size. There's actually the lithium uh, silicate you can see here. Uh, and that high glass content gives an extremely high polishability and great aesthetics. And as I've already mentioned, between the, um, you can polish it or fire it. Um, and continue on with well-defined margins, which have to do with the fit. One of the things that I'm always having to double check myself on, and it's a constant battle, is to make sure that you have nice smooth margins so that the, uh, whether it's a Celter press or a, a one that you mill in the office, you can get a nice fit and feel confident that you're gonna get a, a, a nice uh, seal there. Uh, comparing products in the past that we used, uh, Empress and the Vita Mark II and the Emax, I think we've all experienced using these materials and I've always had a little issue with the, the margin stability and with these products, but with, with Celtra, one of the beauty or one of the things I like about it is its integrity. Uh, it, it's a very, uh, excuse me, it's a very robust margin. I feel confident that when I polish, I can um, go in there with any type of uh, finishing wheel, a fine finish, finishing wheel and polish that and not have fear that the margin is going to break or chip or crack. Um, and so that's, that's uh, something that is very important as we've seen. I know I've had personal experience with a couple of the materials to the left there where I've gotten it all finished and ready to go. And I've seen some of the margins chip at the very end. So it's kind of frustrating, but I feel confident because I do feel it's a very robust margin. Um, again, I had mentioned earlier that opalescence, it reduces that gray in effect. And also you, it gives you that, it kind of pops off the tooth, if you will. It gives you that natural vitality look, that natural opalescence, chameleon effect. And another uh, great advantage of using uh, Celtra uh, and also Celter, you know, whether it's due or press, is that it does blend quite well and, and matches quite well with the Vita Shade Guide that most dentists use. Uh, there's some a result of a case that, that's been done. Um, and let's just look at a few products here that, and, that we've used in the past and still being used. Uh, one of the things about Emacs that I've, like I already mentioned about the, and I, I'm not, you know, here to beat up the Emacs or anything, but I just want to compare and contrast and tell you why. Um, I like Celtra Press better than Emacs, is that when you look at the size of the lithium silicate, disilicate particles, you see that they're quite um, quite large. They have less glass content with them. The light, the, the natural beauty of, of Emacs, while if you're doing the, a full mouth reconstruction will look, would look fine, but if you're doing one or two teeth in the front trying to match something else, to me, Emacs has sort of a dull look to it. Uh, at times, it's very hard to, to get that. Uh, the polishability is not as, as great. And it's harder to polish and to get that aesthetics that you're looking for. But with Celtra, you see the high glass content, and it's dissolved, like it says there, in the zirconia. And then go you know, small is uh, important because when you polish it, the material, it's amazing how quickly and how easily it is, especially if your assistants do your staining and glazing and polishing, or if you do it, how quickly that comes to fruition. It's, it's easy, easy to polish. 
the high flexural strength I already mentioned, the last, and then the, the fluorescence is very uh, lifelike. So in summary, you can kind of see the, the actual microstructure comparison of Seltra and Emax. Seltra has more glass, which re results in higher aesthetics. The invisible zirconia oxide has all to do with the strength, and then the finer microstructure gives a better and easier process and polishability. Celtra Pre, uh, Celtra Duo, we have several shades and stains out now. We have some new ones out in the C and D range, which makes it clinically uh, uh, nice where you can choose what shade you want. And you, you don't have to look at a purple block. You can look at the actual shape. So that really helps to, to do that. The process, as I've mentioned, of the polishability, you can polish a mill and polish in place or you can polish fire in place. And that's just your option, you know, what you're trying to achieve there. And again, the polishing gives you about 210 megapaxel strength as compared to like, say Vita, which is like 140, your old PFMs were like 110 to 120 maybe. So this is kind of doubling that strength just with polishing it. So it's a stronger, inherently stronger material to begin with. Um, if you fire it, you do get up to 370, which is nice. Um, the uses of Seltra, uh, and I, again, I use this uh, mainly with uh, Seltra Press with veneers. I definitely try to do those out of Seltra Press and send that to my laboratory where I this, you know, will, and I'll talk about this later, but discuss the, the shades and the stump shades and the enamel shades and the thickness that I'm wanting and talk about how that's going to play in. And then also I do use photographs at the, um, the lab and I share. If I'm doing inlays or onlays, I could do Seltra Duo crowns. You have the option of doing Seltra Duo or Seltra Press. Um, and then another thing, too, is the three-unit bridge that we can do from uh, as far back as the second premolar, but it's a tooth-to-tooth -tooth bridge or, or an implant-to-implant -implant bridge. So uh, you have the option there, but you definitely want to obviously go from tooth-to-tooth -tooth or implant-to-implant -implant if you're doing a three-unit bridge and not go past the, the second premolars. The bondability or the cementability of the um, of Seltra Press is an option, as I've already mentioned. The glass onomer can be used there. With Seltra Duo, you still have to uh, bond those in. You cannot cement those as of yet. From the laboratory standpoint, you have the uh, three and six mil, uh, six gram, uh, excuse me, three and six gram ingots. Um, and one of the things I'm hearing from my lab too, when I use Seltra Press, I think this is interesting. They have about 16 different options for ingot shades, but they're telling me they only need about six to try to cover the full range of all the colors. We have there's they have ways of mixing and matching and kind of you know blending these together. So it's not a huge inventory for the lab, which is is a big advantage because I know uh, a lot of times when labs uh, press, they have to have a huge inventory. So that's 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 a good good thing. To see, Celta Press is. Uh, just a, a beautiful material. I mean, it, it, like, I, like I say, you have to handle it. You have to see it in the mouth. It gives you a very lifelike and very natural look to, um, to, to your restoration. And so the result of that is that you do get a less of a grain effect in the mouth. And that has all to do with how, how nice it really looks. Uh, the hue, the value, and the chroma, uh, you don't really, once you pick the shade and you kind of, give the information you have very little staining and glazing to do uh, i'm told that it works in every dental furnace uh, you can set those settings for that it's reliable and an easy stain concept and there as i mentioned there is 100 percent stain co coverability on that um, bond strength uh, a lot of times i know we talk about megapaxels and I've, you've heard me mention it several times here today but i think we forget exactly sometimes what megapaxels are referring to uh, it seems like the dentists are wanting more and more and more, but the question is, what what's important? I mean, why do you need more, and where do you need more in? So if you look at like a four-point bending strength on the left there, where you see the forces, two forces coming down with the two supports versus a three-point bending, where it's more like a board supported on two ends with one force coming down, and then versus a biaxial bending, which is really important. And dental restorations, and I think probably in my hand or in my eye, the, the most important 
because you're looking at a force being supported by three different areas. So I'm thinking that has uh, the highest bending strength value. And so it's where you're going to get the most um, uh, uh, pressure and, if you will, and, and stress on a tooth. And that's, that's sort of like when we're in function, when we're laterally, you know, in excursions and we're going from side to side, that's where we really need the strength. And so when you compare self to duo, only polishing it, um, in a three point strength, you see it's, we talk about 210 and then 370 if it's fired and then uh, self to press at 555. But with the biaxial flexure, it's actually greater. So you actually see quite stronger values. So that's, that's important, especially on self to press. You can have the confidence, not only of the aesthetics, but you can have the confidence of the lateral excursions and chewing pressures. Uh, and these, uh, the biaxial flexure strength is quite high. In fact, it, it's almost approaching, and it has actually approached some zirconia levels, but without losing its strength or its aesthetics. So that's important as far as the, uh, the beauty of it and the strength of it. The opalescence of the natural tooth, you can see it's in that, that uh, range of, of um, uh, natural opalescence, and you, you can just see the, how, how nice it covers the, the wavelength uh, range there. We do also look at, uh, you do have the option here in this case of uh, actually cutting back. You can cut back and, and flow material in from a lab standpoint. Obviously, you can do that with the Emacs too, but you can also design this in uh, your software if you want to. Instead of just cutting back, you can actually design the little cutbacks in your software and then flow uh, Selter on, on that. So you've got a lot of options there with this material. Again, reviewing the flexural strength of the Felspar, uh, the, the Vitas, and the, then the Emaxes, and then the Celta Press, you can see that it's quite superior as far as flexural strength. Uh, these are the dimensions of Ponic width that you have to keep in mind. The anterior is 11 and premolar is nine millimeters. And of course, connectors for the three unit bridges need to be a diameter of 16 millimeters, very similar to Emacs, but you just remember that the principle of it is that the height has to be greater or equal to the width. So just some things to keep in mind when you're designing and discussing that with your laboratory to make sure you have those requirements. Uh, I'm pretty much a, uh, a fully uh, adhesive kind of dentist. I like to pretty much bond when I can, but you do have options on these different Seltra materials to um, Seltra press to uh, cement or, um, you know, use a glass automer or bond. So these are the materials up top that I use. Clinical workflow, that's, that's a, a video that I won't show there, but um, considerations for aesthetics. Now to me, this is, this is probably the, uh, this is where the lab and the dentist really have an opportunity to make or break the case. And I think it all has to do with communication with the lab on the dentist endpoint. Uh, I, I just want to speak to dentists here just a few minutes. I think a lot of times we, we expect and rely too much on our labs, especially when we give them insufficient data. And so a, a couple things I want to just stress is that in my practice, I try to always give a lab a, a, a nice prep with a good clinical margin that I'm, I draw, not the lab, so that if anything goes wrong, the lab will say, you know, well, you drew the margin. And so I want to be responsible for my margins. So I want to give them quality up front so that they don't have to try to make something work. So that's with the prep. Now, with the aesthetic part of it, I think I have a, it's incumbent on me to give them as much information up front to help design a case in, aesthetically. And so what that looks like, uh, it would not be to say to my lab, give me an A2 on number eight, that would not be the lab script. The lab script would have several things in it. Number one, I would have a discussion about the stump shape. And I, I typically use uh, Ivo Klar's uh, natural uh, dye uh, stump guide. And so if it's an ND4 or an ND6 or whatever the stump shade is, that gives the lab an idea of what shade uh, that it is. And I will also take photographs and typically if I think it's an N4, ND4 uh, stump shade, uh, 
I will take a photograph of the little uh, uh, sample, you know, that they give you in the little kit of ND4. I'll hold it up against the tooth that I've prepped, and I'll actually take um, a picture, a photograph of that for the lab. And then I will actually go a tooth or a shade on either side of that. So I may give them an ND2 and an ND6 or something like that just to tell them what it's not. And that may, that may sound redundant. But I kind of like to give the lab an idea of of um, what I think it is, and then I'll give them a shade on either side of it to kind of, you know, ND5 or whatever the numbers are, just to kind of uh, let him kind of see what I'm seeing and make sure we're on the same page. Um, obviously, I'm assuming that all our cameras are SLR cameras that have the same lighting and focal length at each picture, so we're not adjusting a whole lot of settings. But... Uh, so if I think it's an ND4, I'll give him an ND3, 4, and 5 and kind of give him a, give him an idea of, uh, of what that should look like. The next thing, obviously, or actually I should say the first thing, should be the enamel shade. Uh, and if I think it's an A2, I will obviously again do an A2 and maybe put an A1 and a, a B1 or A3 or something beside it just to kind of say this is what it's not. So I, I give him... The option because my lab is not in my town my lab is you know miles hundreds of miles away so I like to give them the option visually of what I'm seeing and then the next thing I like to discuss is how thick is the restoration that I'm just going to be doing it how thick is it is it a veneer that's a no prep veneer or is it a veneer that I've prepped or is it a heavy chamfer uh, is there um, a stump shade that's needed uh, or some type of coping or block out due to maybe a gold post that might be showing through the the uh, the tooth. So all these are so important as far as rate, uh, translucency and, and you know, high translucency, low translucency, what kind of material they decide to use. And from that, you can get quite a, a, a nice aesthetic result. And you find that this improves as you use your lab over and over and you develop your own technique that you consistently do with that same lab. So again, don't just say, you know, give me a A3 and count on them to figure out what that is. I mean, I've had labs to tell me, well, most stump forms are ND4s. Okay, well, maybe. But it's nice to give them actual quality information that they can use. Um, just to show you a difference there between high translucency and low translucency materials. Um, this is a case I actually did. Um, it was quite a um, long history and story behind this patient, but the, the gist of it was he had to have a root canal and a buildup on this crown. We had some compromised situations with this example, uh, and I won't go into all that here, but uh, I picked several, several shades in A3. I picked an A3.5, which I really felt this case was more like, and then I picked a, an A4. Um, and so I wanted the lab just to have an idea of what he could see or what, what he saw. Uh, the, the, guy, the patient wanted to actually match that tooth, number 21, with uh, 23 and 24. So you can kind of see that 20 and 22 on either side are a little darker. He's eventually going to change, uh, uh, re re redo those to match it. But you get a nice... Um, Result there that is a uh, self repress uh, that we did. Here's a case uh, we all have these patients that come into us um, once every five years, that kind of thing. And uh, the gentleman was concerned about his front teeth. Obviously, uh, we had done root uh, we had done crowns uh, on number ten and eleven about fifteen years ago. Those were PFMs, and he was wanting really to kind of match that. Uh, we talked about doing uh, six, seven, eight, and nine, but at the time, uh, for other reasons, one being uh, financial, he wanted to do just eight and nine. So we tried to approach that. Uh, he's got a very dark, that's his enamel there. And so you can see the dark dentinal shades underneath there. So this was a, a case that was going to present some potential problems, especially using an all ceramic material like Celter Press. So there are the preps. Uh, and you can see the, the darkness and the tight occlusion. Um, we went in with this uh, natural dye material uh, shade guide, which I was mentioning before. If you've never seen it, there there's others out there, but this is the one that, that we use, and you can kind of match up what you think the, 
the stunt shade is. This is just a stock picture of matching up a, a, a form or a stump shade with um, 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 the ND4 or ND5. But here's an example of what I was talking about earlier where I took ND2, 7, and 8 on a case and obviously feel like it's an ND7. But I put 2 and 8 just to kind of give him an idea of what it's not. And because he may see something like an ND7 that he says, you know, I kind of like ND2 better for whatever reason from what he's going to have to do, maybe uh, because he's got a, a, a very, very thin veneer he's going to do and he's got to block it out more. Just whatever reason the lab feels like he, he needs to use it for to get the, uh, uh, the, the aesthetic result. Here are the enamel shades that we were matching on another case. You can see how we do that. And I do turn them end to end. So it's incisal to incisal. Sometimes I'll flip the tabs the other way and, and go you know, gingival to or gingival to incisal, but just trying to line that up to kind of give the lab an idea of what this is. I felt like it was more of a A1, but kind of wanted to give him that. And here we are doing the enamel shade before we started. So um, you can see the tabs. This is the wax up, if you will, digital wax up beforehand. He likes to send it to me to approve the result. Uh, obviously, the guy had quite short teeth and wide teeth, uh, and this was at cementation. Uh, but you, you get, we got quite a nice aesthetic result that he really liked. Um, here's a Celtic Duo case, number 14, uh, an old amalgam, uh, some recession, uh, removed all that, and then made a nice crown that uh, we cemented in that day, bonded in, I should say. Here's another one down on the lower that we um, bonded in, or uh, pre-op had some cervical decay down at the gingiva and redid the crown for him that way. So that was with Seltzer Duo. Okay, this next case I'm going to skip over because this was not one of my cases, but it was a, a case that uh, a guy did. It was one of his first attempts, but he got pretty good result with that. Here's a case that I was not involved in, but it was a case, uh, I will say for the dentist out there in the dental labs, uh, there are, um, uh, there's a website or a Facebook page, excuse me, called Seltra Nation. It's just one word, Seltra Nation. Uh, Facebook page, uh, I think currently they have over a thousand attendees on that Facebook page. It's, uh, they, labs will post cases on there. It's quite informative. It kind of gets you up to date as if you're a dentist as far as what issues the laboratory is having uh, with, you know, whether it's prep of the dentist or whether it's ideas on how to uh, press better or how to stain better, different issues, you know, with fabricating the, the crown. And uh, this is a case that was done over in Germany. I think it was about a 28-unit case, and it turned out quite well. And I thought the, the aesthetics of it really, you know, jumped off the page. It just really has a pop to it. And you can see the nice translucency and opalescence with that material. Uh, this is another one that was done. Uh, quite nice result. Obviously, uh, this uh, you can have complete confidence when you talk about increasing vertical with this material. Like I say, it's a very strong material. And it does mimic the natural dentition. And there you go. I think uh, I had it. 739 members. Well, this has really grown in the last three months. So it's kind of uh, gone over a thousand now. These are some of my comments that I like to use uh, when I talk about Seltra. I think it just may be the perfect restorative material in dentistry, especially from the strength and aesthetics that we've already talked about. Um, I think Seltra's beauty, the, the aesthetics and strength and all the things, you know, the camel, uh, chameleon effect and the ability to make it cementable, you can cement or bond it, make it a very versatile material. It's not just uh, the beauty, but it's a very versatile material as far as you, how you handle it. And then there, I don't feel like there's any other material out there that really fulfills the aesthetic needs of what we're really looking for today. I know that zirconias are out there and we know that we, we knew the zirconia crowns, the initial zirconia crowns were extremely hard or extremely strong, but had issues with um, aesthetics. I know that is improving, uh, but I will say for the dentist who's out in practice that like in my practice, when I have most of the time, it's, it's you know, 80% of all crowns that we do are, are single units. 
and of those most of those are molars but with that being said on that occasional time you have like a number eight that you're trying to to crown or a number seven and you're trying to match it with the rest of the the, the mouth or the rest of the front, anterior teeth i can't think of a material that blends in better and works better than self suppress i've not seen a zirconia that can really match that i've actually tried zirconia in several cases we had to remake it three and four times and never could quite get what we wanted but we're getting them with the self suppress and i really i really think this is a material that you need to look at it's not just another thing it's not just something else you've got to learn i think it will change your practice and really i think it will take you to a different level and get you excited about doing more aesthetic dentistry um and so that's my uh thing on seltzer I, I do think it's a future and i think it's here and 